This is not a video chat on Wu Chinese shamanism and ritual magic. In fact, it's quite a narrowly tailored conversation. Let's examine the role of the Wu in pre-Qin China. That's prior to 200 BC, prior to Qin Shi Huang, who is considered the first emperor of a united imperial China. We have texts from the Zhou Dynasty 1046 BC to 200 BC that offer a wealth of references to Wu and the role of the Wu during that time. I do also want to look at a few post-Qin 1st century AD texts up to 500 AD, such as the Book of Later Han, circa 6 AD to 189 AD, and the Book of Wei, circa 550 AD. Before we get started, I'm not a historian, I'm not a scholar, I'm a native practitioner. How I retell history is kind of like maybe how your dad or my father would retell history to me. It's storytelling history from a native perspective. That's not to say I didn't do my homework. I am Asian after all. When we say Wu in Mandarin Chinese, we're referring to this word. What a native Chinese speaker today thinks of when they see the word Wu is heavily influenced by post-war era sentiments toward these shamanic traditions. This video is about going back farther in time, way back, to the role of the Wu before imperial China. In archaic Chinese, which we can see remnants of in Cantonese, Minan, and other similar dialects, the pronunciation of the word Wu is Mu. Yeah, kind of like Mu or Mudang in Korean shamanism. Instead of trying to define the Wu, this video is about providing the pre-Chin historical context for how that word gets used in written classical texts. Sifting through pre-Chin texts, such as the Book of Rites of Zhou, Wu is an overarching term, and to draw an analogy to my occupation, it's like saying you're an attorney, a lawyer. Typically, an attorney is going to specialize in a particular subset of the law. For starters, are you a transaction? attorney or are you a litigation attorney? Corporate law, health law, IP entertainment, maritime law, are you a district attorney? You're a prosecutor, a criminal defense attorney, a regulatory attorney, and so on. Likewise, a diviner, shirin, would be considered a wu but is a specialized subset within wu shamanism or the occupation of the wu. There would be an wu who specializes in healing, one in praying to the gods for rain, one in government affairs, one in preserving the history of the people, storytellers. And there were all different niche types of wu. It was even believed that men and women who became wu possessed innately different intrinsic predispositions for particular types of powers relating to connection with the divine. And so you would find court documents referring to official departments of wu shamans that were the advisors to the king comprised intentionally of both men and women. The I Ching makes one line text reference to the Wu in hexagram 57, wind over wind, line 2. Line 2 of hexagram 57, Shun zai chuang sha. Shun is the name of hexagram 57. This Shun, this gentle force, like a wind, is stirring beneath the bed. Yong shi wu fen ruo. Employ the methodologies of the shaman. This shi wu is a designated title describing a shaman who communes with gods and spirits and who petitions the gods and spirits for good auspices. The shi wu is the one who performs the sacrificial rites. In my English translations, I added the additional scribe here because in many annotations and commentaries or interpretations of this line, you will find that somehow the concept of the shaman for wu gets replaced by the concept concept of a scholar. That's my reasoning for adding scribe to explain shu. Fen ruo, in short summary, means to do all the things that the subject matter expert would need to do to resolve the matter, resolve the matter of the wind stirring beneath the bed. Chinese commentaries on this line vary quite a bit. There's a historical reference here to blood sacrifice or using blood in the ritual to remedy the matter, blood magic. More secular scholarly commentaries note that this simply means to employ a diversity of methodologies for your solution to the problem. G. Auspicious to proceed. Wu Zhou. Blameless. There is no blame. No harm. No foul. 
The Book of Rites of Zhou, often referred to simply as the Book of Rites, dated back to 300 BC to 100 BC, makes a couple of instructive references to the Wu shaman. In describing the teams of advisors a king must have at court, there's an entire department of imperial shamans, Wu one Wu specializes in government affairs, a second Wu specializes in history and traditions, a storyteller, a third shaman who serves a bit like an investigator or detective, and then the rest of this shaman department consists of 10 disciple shamans. Si Wu, zhong shi er ren, fu yi ren, shi yi ren, xi yi ren, tu shi ren, Section 124 of the Book of Rites also makes references to Wu shamans who are healers, who provide medicine, and who can cure, say, horses. And so they're also veterinarians, I guess. Here's the excerpt from the Book of Rites, noting that the department of shamans under the king's employ consists of innumerable male shamans and innumerable female shamans, attributing equal importance to both, and also seemingly distinguishing the specialized roles of both. Among the Wu, one holds a particularly important office in the king's court of ministers, and that is the Wu shaman in charge of divination, the Shiren. All important events of the kingdom must be determined first and foremost by divination. There are three divinatory systems employed by the court diviner, this particular specialty of the Wu shaman. Academics and Asian occultists will fiercely debate what the first two divinatory systems refer to, but that third I'm betting many of you recognize, the Zoe as in the I Ching. That passage lists the many different titles and offices of Wu shamans, getting into the hierarchy of shamans in the shaman department of the imperial court. Literally reads like an ancient Chinese corporate organization chart of shamans. When the kingdom faces disaster or drought, the head chancellor shaman will lead a gathering of shamans to dance, sing, and perform the sacrificial rites per the old ways. Yep, that's what it says. So old, ancient, and traditional from the perspective of the 4th and 5th century BCE. A particular rite or ritual of the Wu shaman is referenced in the Book of Rites. The ritual for averting disaster performed by the shamans involves 1. A box containing the wood effigy or host 2. A ritual cloth or spirit cloth 3. A basket of grass stalks that will be needed by the diviner shiren shaman during the ritual 4. Those same stalks of grass are to be used to summon and petition the gods, the spirits. And 5. This must be done in all four directions to call upon the directional gods and spirit guardians. And here is the passage I was just referencing. You'll find several instances across many pre-Chin texts describing a basket or bundle of dried stalks, be that grass, reeds, or bamboo, as an important tool of the Wu shaman. These stalks are used during ritual, in rites and ceremonies, divination, and for communicating with the gods and spirits. Case in point, one call out, section 141 of this section of the Book of Rites, Wu shamans are also responsible for giving last rites at all funerals. Per the Book of Rites, they exorcise the coffin and then consecrate it so that whoever is laid to rest in it will be safeguarded for eternity. Now let's talk about why the text might have emphasized the equal importance of having both male and female shamans as part of the king's court of advisors. The male shaman, Nan Wu, which in a 453 BC text Guoyi referred to as Shi, according to Zhou Dynasty texts, intrinsically possess a predisposition for the following. They lead the sacrificial rites, they read the omens, they lead the divination rituals using stalks of grass, which, if you ask me, is either a direct reference to I Ching divination with Euro stalks, or at the very least is describing a direct ancestor of using Euro stalks in I Ching divination. They lead ceremonies that call upon the guardian spirits or protector gods of the four directions. They're healers and, well, ancient Chinese healthcare providers. 
And then, of course, male shamans occupy most of the positions of shiren, that subset specialty of diviners under the umbrella heading wu shamans. The female shamans, nu wu, which that 400 BC text refers to simply as wu, seems to suggest that women are mediums and have a predisposition for spirit possession. They also lead exorcisms. They're tasked with warding off evil and vanquishing demons and ghosts. They're also, by nature, more gifted at purification rituals and creating tinctures and healing herbal baths. Again, just to clarify, this is not me saying this and not reflective of my opinion or my beliefs. I'm quoting from a book that is almost 3,000 years old. The Shuo Wen Jiezi, circa 1st century AD, which is a bit like an ancient Chinese encyclopedia, describes the female shaman and the male shaman. The female shaman has a greater innate ability, according to that text, to control invisible things that are formless and the unseen. In contrast, the male shaman is better equipped innately intrinsic to the shaman's gender, according to the text, not me, at being a diviner, presumably suggesting that they are better at divination rituals utilizing those yarrow stalks. There's a historical account from the Tun Chou Zuo Chuan on events happening during the spring and autumn period of ancient China, around 720 BC to 480 BC. One summer, there was a severe drought, and the shamans, specific reference to these Wu folks, were tasked to pray and dance for rain. Because that's their job. Well, rain did not come. The drought continued, so the people decided to burn the shamans. And then from there, I read from several sources that that's actually kind of normal. Your job is to convince the gods to help your people out. If the gods stop listening to you, then maybe the gods have stopped favoring you. And if the gods have turned their backs on you, well then, yikes. Another fun account from the Book of Rites is one of the duties of a female shaman, the Niu, which is to walk ahead of the queen when the queen goes out on excursions beyond the palace walls. The female shaman must clear the pathway that the queen will be taking of any evil or bad spirits to protect the queen's path. One without constancy cannot be a diviner, either with the tortoise shell, oracle bones, or the stalks. That word I translated to constancy is hung, as in hexagram 32 of the I Ching, the eternal. In I Ching discourse, hexagram 32, the eternal, is considered a really important hexagram in terms of expressing spiritual cultivation, the Tao, and divinity. Interpreting hexagram 32, and I do recommend that you get out my book, I Ching the Oracle, for this. Turn to page 555 with me in the text, I Ching the Oracle. How is this hexagram entry instructive on the attributes that the Wu shaman must cultivate? Constant, enduring, and persistent cultivation of the way, which later Taoism syncretized into its philosophy, the Tao. Strive to occupy the center, in the way that hexagram 32 is the midpoint of the 64 hexagrams. Do not be too forceful, because strength must come naturally. Cultivate strength from within, and then let it flow forth and simply be strength, rather than trying to force the strength. Embody De, which is the De of Dao De Jing, meaning the virtue of abiding by the way, the virtue of the Tao. You must learn to sense what others cannot sense, see what is not there, hear what makes no sound, feel that which has no substance. I'm deriving that from line four of the hexagram. Every divination must be approached with sincerity. You're coming before the gods and ancestors, so behave accordingly. When you read line 5, the metaphor there is about submitting rather than asserting. There is a really beautiful point that's a core thesis of the I Ching. The only thing constant is change. That which endures is that which is willing to change. For there to be stability and prosperity, there must be constant change yielding to the way. If at any point you become static, stagnant, unable to yield to change, that's when the establishment will crumble. That's the beginning of the end. 
Hexagram 32 is also about persistence, endurance, and never giving up no matter how bad it gets. Heng is the doctrine of the eternal, an important tenet in Shang and Zhou dynasty shamanism. Which is why in many Shang and Zhou dynasty texts that reference Wu shamanism, you're also going to see references to the doctrine of Heng, the eternal. It is wind carrying the force of thunder, which is a reference to the hexagram itself, the trigram thunder over the trigram wind. There is this text, oft translated into English as spring and autumn dew from the Western Han Dynasty, sometime between 206 BC and 9 BC, written by this guy, Dong Zhong Shu. The passage of interest is in section 3 of a chapter titled Praying for Rain Ritual, Chou Yu. The ritual involves the dance of the dragon to go on for six days. What is the dance of the dragon as performed by the shaman? Not sure, but there still are some great insights in this passage. Some interesting connections here, though, to Taoist ceremonial rituals of pacing the Big Dipper. In Chinese, the Big Dipper star is Bei Dou Xing, meaning the North Dipper. North, winter, Big Dipper. Oh, and the reason I bring up winter is because in that passage, there's a reference to the winter solstice. The word there, wu, that I translated to dance also means pace. The dance of the dragon might be an ancient ancestor of the Taoist ritual of pacing the Big Dipper. If you don't know what pacing the Big Dipper is, there's a quick explanation in my book, The Tao of Craft. Look for pacing the Big Dipper in the index for the corresponding page numbers. Now back to that passage. A four-way altar or shrine, a spiritual throne of some sort, is placed outside the northern gate of the city, about six chi in size. One ancient chi is about 10 inches, so that's about 60 by 60 inches for the altar table, which must then be adorned with six black banners. The shamans will be wearing black clothing. Black dye back then would have been made from iron vitriol. The shamans will invoke the god Xuanming, the god of water, winter, and the god of the north. Sacrificial offerings to the god Xuanming include black dogs, a specific type of consecrated wine or liquor, and preserved fruits and or dried meats. Xuanming, also known as Xuanwu, in addition to being the god of the north, of water, the seas, wind, and plagues, and as reference in Zhou dynasty texts as a deity venerated by the Wu shamans, such as in ritual prayer for rain, was described as a dark tortoise and a serpent snake, sometimes dragon. Although in the 4th century BC text San Hai Jing, the Book of Mountains and Seas, the North God has a human face, a bird's body accompanied by two green snakes and two red, and is the rain master. In the Zhuangzi, Xuanming is associated with the North Pole Star. In later centuries, the Dark God of the North was also known as Bei Di and or Hei Di, depending on region. He was described as the father of Yu the Great, and you may recall from previous videos and also from chapter 2 of my book that Yu the Great was that legendary ancient shamanic king who stopped the Great Floods. There's also these myths associated with Hei Di that he was a great warrior god for Tian Di, the god of heaven, and commanded legions of celestial armies for the god of heaven and defeated all these demons and ghosts. Very Archangel Michael vibes if you ask me. If you can, turn to Appendix C at the back of your book, I Ching the Oracle, to follow along on this chart, Table 12.7, Trigrams and Feng Sui Correspondences. The planetary correspondence here is Mercury. For my Western occultists watching this, Hermes Trismegistus, anyone? Magic, U shamanism, sorcery, ceremonial rites, and ritual magic? I don't know. I thought that was interesting. In contemporary Taoist occultism, combining feng shui correspondences with the directional deities, Bei Di, the north god, in addition to being a warrior god of water, rain, and wind, associated with a snake and sacred tortoise, is petitioned for matters relating to career advancement and professional success. Likewise, if you have a question for divination relating to work and career matters, specifically invoke the North God and then use the I Ching as the medium or tool for communicating with the North God and receiving revelations from him.
Speaking of a divination ritual, here's what a 3rd century BCE text has to say about what goes into a proper divination ritual. A divination ritual requires 1. Observing the sun, meaning astrological timing. 2. Fasting, and this requirement comes up several times in several different texts on divination. 3. Consecration, which involves incense. 4. Preparing the spiritual seat, and your guess is probably as good as mine on what that means. 5. Making the sacrifices, and here it's a form of sweet grain, sorghum, maize, or millet. And 6. Reciting the prayers. In this other text I came across, circa Han Dynasty 25 to 265 AD, there's a reference to a Da Shi, great master, who selects an auspicious day for divination and then fasts for five days prior. Fasting, zai jie, in this context doesn't mean you don't eat anything. Fasting before a divination or ceremonial ritual meant no meat, no onions, leeks, or garlic, and no alcohol. It needs to be noted that different traditions and lineages will also have their own rules for fasting. Also, generally, it's not limited to food, it's abstinence on many fronts. And then there's this passage from the Wen Shi Zhen Jing or Guan Ying Zi from the chapter 7 Cauldrons. The past emanates in the present. The present first emanated in the past. Know the Tao of this, and one can divine with oracle bones and yarrow stalks. The Guan Ying Zi is that mystery book I was talking about in my previous video. This passage is about those Wu with the innate ability to manifest, to enchant, to curse or hex, whose words can reach the gods, who the gods listen to. This word in particular is the word referring to prayer, spellcasting, enchanting, cursing, hexing, sorcery, as a verb. This line cites the power to use ink and writing characters or words, food talismans, and notes those who harness the power of qi to change reality through their fingertips. Okay, skipping ahead, something about how if you are deceitful or harbor ulterior motives in your heart, you won't be able to get the gods to listen to you, blah, 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 nothing to see here. Oh, well, there is this reference to the Yi, as in the Yi Ching, affirming that this is a tool for divination that the Wu uses to receive divine messages and revelations on the truth of any and all matters, that the Yi Ching is a source of truth on whatever it is you may seek to inquire. About. Let's start synthesizing some of these findings. We read in the Book of Rites from the Zhou Dynasty that among Wu shamans, there were three common divinatory methods employed, and the third of the three that was called out was the Zhou Yi or the Yi Ching. We know that this was one of the main divinatory methods used by the Wu. But we don't actually know for sure what that system of divination refers to. And we know that this was the second of the three that the Wu shamans employed. We believe this second method involves gua or hexagrams or maybe trigrams, maybe kind of sort of similar to the I Ching, but we don't know much more than that. We know that the Wu shamans used stalks of dried tall grasses in their divination method, which is either the yarrow stalk method of I Ching divination or the ancestor to the yarrow stalk divination method. These stalks of grass per a particularized specialty casting method employed by the pre-Qin dynasty Wu, that's before 200 BC, were used not only for divination, but used in ritual for summoning gods and spirits. The role of the Wu shifts alongside the changing role of the Book of Changes as we enter Imperial China, particularly from the Song Dynasty 900 AD to Qing 1800s. The I Ching is among the five classics that every scholar must master in order to pass the Imperial Civil Service exams. These were national exams you had to pass if you wanted to enter the aristocracy, hold a government position, or be part of the military. The social class of the Wu, who were in effect the keepers of the Yi, 
shifted from shamans to scholars and court officials, who were often Taoist alchemists or practitioners of esoteric Buddhism. The I Ching was integral to Chinese thought throughout imperial China, but now it's treated more as a philosophy. It becomes Confucian influenced. It's integrated into Taoism. The coin tossed method is popularized during this second era, where the first era I labeled as pre Qin, and now this being imperial China. The coin toss method being popularized in imperial China makes sense because now, because of that focus on philosophy and the sciences, including the predecessor of East Asian psychology, we're okay with the concepts of chance and probability as the driving force of the I Ching casting method. Whereas the Yarrowstock divination method seems to focus more on invocation of gods and spirits as the driving force of the I Ching casting method. And then during this second era of imperial China, the focus when using the I Ching is on analysis and rumination of the text itself. Whereas during the pre Qin era up to around 200 BC, the Yarrowstock divination method conveys the importance of ritual. In dynasties such as the Jin and Qing, when the Manchu, not the Han, ruled imperial China, Manchurian shamanism was the dominant state religion, and as it was translated or expressed to the Han people, this was referred to as Wu shamanism. Whereas at this point, most of the Han ethnic group was Taoist or Buddhist. So now, in Chinese, two fairly distinct magical or mystical traditions and systems and their associated religious practices were simultaneously being referred to as Wu shamanism. Not at all confusing. <laughs> also, as a result of syncretization, clear lines get blurred. A lot of Wu shamanistic practices are integrated into both Buddhism and Taoism and vice versa. We then enter modern China, or the post-war era, after the fall of the Qing. Both the role of the Wu shaman and the I Ching Book of Changes recedes into obscurity. After watching this video, I hope you'll go and read chapter 10 from my book I Ching the Oracle. This video discussion is just a preliminary introduction to what I address in chapter 10. So I hope after watching this video, your next stop is reading that chapter.